Hi everyone, and click back again here. And so today we're going to be reacting to game theory or theories killing video games. This just came out a few minutes ago, actually, as we're recording this, and I'll try to edit it before Monday. Uh, this is my last uh, weekend of the holidays before I am going back to school. So yeah, I hope you really liked that uh, video. It was a big departure from the last videos that I've been doing, and I just wanted to do it because. Yeah, I have a friend had come over and he said that he wanted to try and record the videos to see how it is. Because we're actually planning a special project with him. So yeah, that's all I'm going to say for a moment. I'm still trying to keep a surprise. But yeah, so our theory is killing video games. Now, this reminds me, oddly, a lot of a video he did a few years ago back um, on why on theory is killing films, if I remember correctly. Yeah, wait a second, give me a second. No, oh, it was specifically on um, Star Wars. Yeah, how Star Wars series killed Star Wars. It's a lot like that video, actually. Anyway, so yeah, let's begin. Again, I'm still using the um, sponsor block um, add-on for Firefox, so that's why we're starting in at three seconds instead of just the usual zero seconds it's the beginning let's start story a true story a story about an email i received from a game developer that for privacy reasons has to go nameless but let me assure you that it's someone who works on a game franchise that you're quite familiar with anyway we'd done a theory or two trying to predict the plot line and some early twists for their upcoming game out of the blue i received this email from the ceo of the company asking me if i had a mole on the inside feeding me information now obviously it was a joke but also not quite a joke anyway i was just ecstatic that we we were on the right track and then the game came out and it was nothing like our theory had predicted it also seemed rushed and a bit unpolished like a lot had been changed in the game last minute it got me wondering whether our theories had prompted them to change the game in order to move the storyline away from what i predicted but no that, that that could be right right are developers actually changing their games in response to fan theories well f and uh. Stop it with all the nice theories for goodness sake. I'm trying to find whether or not, because I can try to spend time and try to probably find... I'll try to see whether or not we can try to find this later on, and if ever I can find um, the game, I will put it in, and if not, then yeah, we'll have to go back. Uh... Okay, anyway. Sorry for that little side tangent, I just wanted to look very quickly, if anyone had discovered. I'll try to look. So it's two theories on a game, but then when it came out, felt a bit rushed and unpolished. Hmm. Well, we'll have to check. Yay! Oof, I think it's over 400 videos now that we have to go over. And it was for a game that he had done before it released. <laughs> Friends, that's exactly what I aim to find out today. Hello, Internet. 
Welcome to Game Theory, the show that 60% of the time gets it right every time. Lately, and maybe it's just me, I've been seeing a lot of discussion around my role, uh, this channel's role in the wider games industry. Obviously, I got that email that I mentioned in the cold open, but I also had this random conversation the other week with someone who said that getting a theory video made for your series is like landing a white whale. Let's just make sure that there are fewer harpoons there, Ahab. There's also been... Yeah, but... Again, Matt, you run a channel with... Sorry, for goodness sake, automatic blinds. Oh, it's a bit annoying, sorry. Yeah, you run a channel with over 15.7 million subscribers. I can't just say, I love it how the topic is FNAF. <laughs> go. I just find it hilarious for some reason. Anyway, but yeah, you run a... 15.7 million channel, uh, subscriber channel. Of course, yes, if ever a game gets a theory made by you, it is going to be important. I mean, 15 million people, can you imagine that? All of them, well, maybe not all of them, but most of them watching your video, like already here, in the few, like, nearly probably an hour or two that it came out. In total, there's 17,412 views. Enormous. But anyway. Videos from creators like Dags and Sagan Hawks that explore the evolution of indie horror and our specific role in Dags, by the way, Dags is a great guy, honestly. You should go and watch Dags. And... What's the other guy's name? Creators like Dags and Sagan Hawks. Sagan Hawks, I'll have to check. But yeah, I am subscribed to Dags and he is a very good... I love his voice, by the way. He's very good. And Sagan Hawks... I have to check Dart. I've been thinking of actually doing content that resembles a lot of what Dags does, actually, because I I find it very inspiring, hard to see. So yeah, anyway, let's continue. Sorry, my hair is a bit in a mess today. Talks that explore the evolution of indie horror and our specific role in that. If you're lucky enough, you may get the blessing of the gods that is a game theory video <laughs> yeah. story. In this era of post-FNAF indie horror, it can be really easy to want to chase that trend, filling your game with secret lore. But if it doesn't fit your concept, don't do it. Don't chase that game theory video. There's also meme material like this. No, don't get me wrong. I don't bring all... Chase that game theory video. There's also meme material like... I think Matt and Jitsu will enjoy dissecting this frame by frame. Yes, you should totally reply to RDN. Yes. <laughs> oh. this. No, don't get me wrong. I don't bring all this up to be self-aggrandizing. Like, oh, look at how important we are to the games industry. I bring all this are. up to question the assumption. Is this actually true? Is there evidence to suggest that games are changing themselves in response to theorists? Have we and other online theorists shaped the way that... Dorko. <sighs> if, if if you don't know Dorko, by the way, you should watch it. Very good. Um, one of um, I think he is by far the best uh, FNAF YouTuber out there. Games are made and marketed, and has this sometimes resulted in worse games? Well, first and foremost, we know that we have a very strong impact on search results. Last May, during our video on the game Only Cans, I made a quick offhand joke about the 19-year-old meme Lemon Party. That new flavor's name, Lemon Party. By the way, do not Google that. Super random, right? But wouldn't you know it, off of that very brief mention, suddenly searches for the term Lemon Party hit their highest point in five years. And this is after we told you to not Google it. So do me a favor, don't hit that subscribe button, and absolutely do not leave a comment that has the word jump kick in it. Don't you dare, don't you even think about it. I will be so disappointed in you if you do, but that's just a search term. What about an actual game? Well, we dug around using Google Trends, which, if you're not familiar, tracks the volume of search traffic over time, data that can then be filtered by geographic region and search platform. So we started to look at games that the channel had covered in the past, starting with one from four years ago, the VR game Duck Season. If you don't remember this one, it had a cute animal mascot, I remember. a horrible family, dead kids, a 1980s aesthetic, and none of this is... What game are we talking about now? I honestly... That's like too vague. I don't... Yeah, you have to be a bit more specific. Really help it narrow 
down, is it? It was yeah. our mission in that first video to reveal the identity of the murderous dog mascot behind it all. Just another normal day over here at Game Theory. That video is one of our best performing videos of all time with over 19 million views, so we stuck the term duck season into Google Trends, and wouldn't you know it, the timing of our video's release corresponded to the highest peak in search traffic ever for both YouTube and on the web in general. Other spikes and trends certainly seem to exist immediately after the game's release when Jacksepticeye, Corey X Kenshin, and of others course. played the game, but in December of 2017, web search had dropped to 47% of the high. Then in January, immediately after our theory, 100% all-time high of search traffic. If we get even more granular, you can see that the highest point from 12-1-2017 to 1-31-2018 is December 31st, the day after our video came out. We kept searching and we kept seeing the same thing over and over again. Mobile game Lily's Garden, video June mm -hmm. 22nd, 2021, 100% spike in YouTube search immediately afterward. Andy's Apple Farm, game released November 26th, 2021, our video December 12th, 2021, 100% spike. And it wasn't just for game theory either. Nightmind, a theorist for all things creepy, had a video on Catastrophe Crow 64 in early February 2021. And sure enough, we see a sizable spike in trends for the United States right after the video releases. When you run the same trend search worldwide, get a different 100% during the week of February 21st to 27th. Widros Rotsank, award-winning Venezuelan YouTuber, released his video on the topic. And then our video came out on March 13th, setting a new, higher benchmark for the whole thing. Theorists, not just us, it would seem, get people excited to search for more info on the games that they talk about. But okay, this is all for small titles that no one would normally be searching for. What about something more mainstream? Well, we see this trend happening with massive titles as well. In 2019, Minecraft saw this massive resurgence yeah. in popularity, with its 10-year anniversary happening in May, and then PewDiePie picking up the game in June. Long live Sven Svensson. But despite a year full of huge events for this long-running, massively popular series, searches for Minecraft peaked on both YouTube and on the web between July 21st and 27th, the week we started our deep dive lore analysis. I will always remember that week. Like July 23rd, 2019, I will always remember that week, that week of July. Like that week was and still is in my mind one of the best weeks that I have ever had. I'll probably explain it in another day, but right now I don't have much time. But that week was something for me. That was. Wow, I don't think I'll ever have a week as good as that one ever again into the game. In fact, that week was the most search that Minecraft had been since 2015. A <laughs> record that has only been surpassed in mid-2020 by the surge of some guy that you might be familiar Dream. with, Dream. Even when you're talking about crazy viral hits like Among Us, the game hits its peak in web search on September 20th. Our first video on the title came out the day before, September 19th. At this point, it certainly seemed like there was a strong correlation between our coverage of a game and it reaching... The and I'm sure he's gonna say that correlation doesn't uh, equal causation or something like that because you said that quite a few times in prior videos. But let's see. Can I anticipate what he's gonna say or not? The height of its search traffic immediately thereafter. And honestly, it does make some amount of anecdotal sense. We watch our stuff and we tell you that there's something cool and compelling in this game. Naturally, some of you are gonna wanna know more. You're gonna wanna find more clues and help solve the mystery. I mean, why else do you think we've done 50 videos on FNAF at this point? As theorists, we're not just engaging with these games at a surface level, making jokes at a game and then moving on to the next like a lot of Let's Players tend to do. We're trying to immerse you in these worlds, mm -hmm. highlight the storytelling that's being done inside the games, or should be being done inside these games. And heck, if you like our little primer on it, then you're inclined to dig deeper and explore the world for yourself. But that's just talking about audience interest. What I want to know now is whether these trends have led developers to start paying attention attention to us. Have online theorists actually made an impact in the way that games are marketed and made? Let's start with the game that we actually went back to recently, Merge Mansion. Originally, we covered this mobile game's lore on October 24th, 2021, concluding that Grandma is a cold-blooded murderer in disguise. Shortly after our theory, a message got sent out to players by the game itself, telling them that Grandma did nothing wrong, she has nothing to hide, followed by a YouTube link where you could find four live-action videos starring actress and sledgehammer enthusiast Kathy Bates. Can I prove that we were the thing that prompted them to go with that campaign? No. No, I can't. But does the timing work out for them?
them to have seen our theory and then leaned into the whole granny's innocent wink wink angle? You betcha. That's some circumstantial evidence, but can we make a more one-to-one -one connection? What about something more substantial? <coughs> something a bit more narrative driven? What about Bendy, Bendy and, and the, the Ink, ink machine? machine? We made a theory after the release of Chapter 2 talking about this random angel character. This character that had shown up in a random poster on the wall, mm -hmm. speculating that she was going to be important to the story moving forward. First, we'll see Alice take center stage as the game goes on. Like Betty Boop, we'll hear about how her popularity skyrocketed, surpassing Bendy. Sure enough, when Chapter 3 released 123 days after the video, the world was introduced to Alice Angel. She was front and center. Now, did we predict what the creators were going to do with Alice all along, or Maybe. did we somehow speak this new character into being? According to Mike Mood in an interview, We'd like to say we knew exactly what was going to happen, but really, at the end of the day, we knew the beginning and we knew the end of the game. Everything that happened in between was kind of developed as we went along. In chapter two, we had a poster of Alice Angel, and that was just one poster. There was nothing explaining what this character was. The fans just started doing fan art, and just fell in love with the character, and it made it really obvious that chapter three should be about Alice Angel. That right there is pretty conclusive. They literally took ideas from the fan community and used them to fill out their story, which, let me be clear, isn't a bad thing. It's, it's very awesome good. to listen to the fans and respond to the things that they're all most excited about, but it's clear that we, the collective we playing these games, not just us theorists, we influenced how Bendy turned out those middle chapters. So now we're starting to see how theories can have an influence for the better, or for the worse. <laughs> Which segues Let's see. nicely to the 300 pound elephant in the room, Hello Neighbor. At least he's a dapper elephant. I mean, he wears a sweater, vest, and everything. Now, you might remember this little series of tweets from April 2020. For anyone that doesn't, Tiny Build, one of the developers for Hello Neighbor, had just released a TV pilot and began tagging my Twitter in their posts. See really? Oh, I need to check. Uh, uh, because I'm someone who actually likes Hello Neighbor, so I'll have to check that if there is actually like a TV series on Hello Neighbor or not. Seemingly trying to get another theory out of me. However, some have suggested that this block of tweets is part of a larger pattern of behavior. A pattern that implies that Tiny Build changed the game Hello Neighbor during development to chase theory videos like ours. But is that true? To figure it out, we decided to look at the development cycle for the game. I'm gonna skip the first couple of alphas because they didn't give us too much to work with. Basically, during this period, Hello Neighbor's popularity was doing fine, but nothing to write home about. Alpha 2 was released on November 22nd, 2016, 27 days after after the last build. In fact, up until this point, Tiny Build was releasing a new version of Hello Neighbor every 27 to 30 days like clockwork. And, wouldn't you know, 30 days after Alpha 2, Alpha 3 gets released. Players are treated to a much larger house with more rooms and a ton more to look at. But then things start to get weird. You see, sandwiched in there on December 15th is the release of our two-part Hello Neighbor expose, which looked at all the demonic and satanic symbols around our dear Mr. Rogers wannabe. In the latest alpha build of the game, you can find a house on a darkened street. And look at the bottom of his shoes. A seal six, six, that reads six. Six, six, six. The devil's the number. Of the beast. Combined, these two videos have been viewed 19.3 million times. Now, there's such a short time period between our video on the 15th and the Alpha 3 release that there's no way our video could have altered that version of the game. Beyond that, though, things get a little bit odd. Alpha 4 is released May the 4th, 2017, a whopping 133 days after Alpha 3. Now, remember, all the other releases were only a month apart, but Alpha 4 was in development for over four times the length of anything prior to it. It's also an oddly similar amount of time to the gap between our video on Alice Angel and the release of Bendy Chapter 3. But it wasn't just the length of time between versions that was noteworthy. It was also what Tiny Build had used the lengthy design time to create, specifically the game's brand new nightmare sequences, where you're broken away from the main stealth gameplay that had been the selling feature up to that point and transported to another section to play surreal minigames where lore takes the center stage. And this is the trend that would continue until the game's release. Once Hello Neighbor came out, it was disappointing to say the least. Yeah. A lot of people were really excited about this game, myself included. The original concept of an AI learning how you broke into a house and changing tactics accordingly was brilliant, but it seemed that there was a decision made to chase the hype at the cost of this original concept. They changed tactics and focused more on the lore of the series, which again, seems to be backed up by the tweets and their eventual book series and their TV pilot, and in turn, they lost focus on the game itself, which became a broken, buggy mess. But of course, if we're talking about Buggy Games, no one else
almost takes the cake like security breach. Of course. Uh, Freddy, Freddy, I'm gonna yes. shove a beak inside of you, and you are going to be able to talk better. You... Did you hate the idea that much? You haven't seen so many things, and yet you've seen Karate Kid, huh? Yeah. By the way, if you don't know what this uh, video is, because for some reason, un unless you should say at the end, this is on Doku's channel. Um, the, once Doku had uh, beaten the 50 20 mode for FNAF Ultimate Custom Night in 2018, um, Scott had promised to do an interview with uh, Doku. And that was one of the things that he had talked about. So, yeah, if ever you're looking for this video specifically, it's on Doku's channel. Uh, just look up Doco interview Scott Coffin. Sometimes had an antagonistic relationship back and forth. You know, I, I inconvenienced him with my games, and sometimes he inconveniences me with his spirit. Yeah, inconvenience. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it's all in good fun. He did a video on that box, and he kind of said that he thinks the contents of the box changed over the years. But I, I saw that and I was like, he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. The contents of that box have changed over the years. What I was intending the game to be when it happened, and then after the reaction of it, I was like, I, I, need, to, I need to craft this into something better just for the people who see this as important. And that kind of indirectly does change the contents of the box, you know, because it, 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 it changes the contents of everything that came before. When you start retconning lore elements or changing the details within the game, your story, and in turn your fan base that theorized and loved your game, are the ones that ultimately suffer. Let's be honest, FNAF lore always been complicated, even when you're not talking about these changes. But it never felt like the games suffered. It felt like Scott was very much in control of the story and where it was going. But Security Breach was just a lot messier than your standard yeah. Freddy Fazbear experience. From a gameplay standpoint and from a lore standpoint. And if fan theories were right and they changed the original story because of it, well, then it would explain why the game was so unpolished and the lore so incomplete. By rushing to try and make something surprising, they ultimately shot themselves in the foot. They changed elements of the story to make it different but forgot to take everything out. And so we're left wondering if Vanny and Vanessa are the same person, which everything up to that point had been leading up to. They even went back and changed the princess's name in the game files back to Princess instead of Cassidy. The one lore piece that we felt like we had nailed, they've now changed retroactively, which makes it all the more confusing. Were we right and they changed it? Was this an Easter egg? Was it intentional? Who knows? Just let us have something. And you see, that's the point. Let us have something. Developers, if you're watching, just let us be right. Don't be afraid that YouTubers or Reddit threads guessing the story is gonna make you your game any less fun. If anything, it adds to the excitement for us theorists. When we get to that final boss and the twist is revealed and we realize that we had called it all along, that is way more satisfying than a half-finished game with a messy story meant to subvert our expectations. It means that congr- Yeah, Game of Thrones. <sighs> Let's not go into that. People have already- people who are way smarter than me have already done their changes on how they'll change. Um, the final season of Game of Thrones, and I'm 
on that microphone. The last season of Game of Thrones was a mess. Which is a shame, really. I mean, I'm someone who loves Game of Thrones, especially because where um, I have spent a lot of time when I was younger in Northern Ireland. Nowadays, for more personal reasons, we haven't been going there. And yeah, I've actually seen where they have shot and uh, where they shot some of the scenes for the films, uh, for, for, for films, for the TV series. And I've walked across the June Sands on Port Stewart, which I think is where they did Dorne, I think? I'm not sure. But anyway, yeah. So it is a bit disappointing. Especially for four, yeah, for someone like me who spent a lot of who spent a lot of time in Northern Ireland while it was being filmed. Anyway, let's continue. Congratulations, you laid out the clues in a sensible way that some very dedicated fans were able to follow and piece together. And hey, if and when we get stuff wrong, that's great too. We're okay with that. It just means that we have more to theorize about. In the end, don't sacrifice your game's integrity just trying to make us wrong in retrospect. I think Game of Thrones author George R.R. R. Martin said it best. You know, I have certain things that I'm laying clues for that there'll be revelations later on. Some people had put together those clues even as early as 1998 and are adding things to good. What do I do with that? What do I do with that? The, yeah, these people have guessed the secret that I'm going to reveal in book six. People have already guessed that here and book two is just out. You really have two choices there. You can ignore it, proceed with your plan, despite the fact that some people know where you're going. Or you can get all panicky and say, oh my God, they figured it out. I can't let that be. I'll have to change it. I'll have to go in a different direction. And I, I think some writers do that. And I think that's always a mistake. Yeah. You know, if you've planned your book that the butler did it, and then you read an internet, someone has figured out that the butler did it, and you suddenly change in midstream, and it was the chambermaid who did it, then you screw up the whole book, because you get these, this foreshadowing early on, and you've got these little clues you planted, now they're dead ends, and... You have to introduce other clues and you're retconning, it's a mess. We know developers recognize the impact reactions from fans and YouTubers have, and at times include extras and games for us to find, hoping for us to get excited about finding them. But too many games that started out in a really good place with a passionate team making something they love get a taste of that hype train and start changing things. Suddenly they're trying to chase the train for just one more ride rather than staying the course. <coughs> love great games with hidden lore, but not at the cost of everything else. We love when developers try and stretch themselves to achieve something special, but we don't want to see internet clout cause them to compromise their vision. Just make the game and the story that you want to make, the one you intend to make. Because if it's well made and enjoyable, then we'll inevitably want to play it and talk about it. If we guess the story early, that's totally okay. Add some easter eggs pointing to the next installment. If we get exactly, yeah. Plus it goes back to um, the idea of uh, Hitchcockian suspense, which is that when you know that something's going to be happening in advance, then you get that idea of suspense. Uh, I'm, I'm not very good at explaining it, honestly. Um, try to find someone who can explain the concept of Hitchcockian suspense, and I don't even think that's, that's the correct term for it. I know that Alfred Hitchcock had um, given an example with uh, uh, I didn't give an example, but I forget the example that he'd given. But yeah, um, it's something along the lines of if uh, people know that something is going to be happening in a film in advance, then they you have given your audience suspense and dread for what's coming. Because they know it's coming, they just don't know when, so we're dreading every single moment of it. Which is honestly one of the reasons why I think that spoilers aren't that bad, honestly. People, I, I've always seen people, especially here in my family, always rage about spoilers, about saying, don't spoil it for me, don't spoil it for me, but I've never understood that, like, if you know something's going to be happening, then you'll enjoy the film better. If I told you that someone is, was going to die, then you would be cherishing every single moment you would see that character on screen, because you know that we're going to be ending soon. Anyway, but that's for our discussion something wrong, that's okay too. And if you don't want to include any real lore at all, fine, I'll still be here, ready to claim that it's secretly a sequel to Earthbound anyway. Let them argue their theories, whether they're right, whether they're wrong, but I don't need to know about that. But hey, that's, that's just, just a theory. theory. A, a game theory. theory. Thanks, Thanks for watching. watching. Yeah, now, I thought some individual total. <laughs> I think that it's 
Very good. Finally, he's addressing this topic. Um, I think that it's very important for him to like address these sort of things because I've always found it to be interesting, to say the least. Uh, because I'm someone who spends a lot of time, you know, watching his theories. I even theorize, and I even spend a lot of time on Reddit, like going through the, him, his subreddit. And I always find it very interesting to see all the theories because I have got my own theories about different games that have come out or that are going to come out. Like, I would really, I would really love um, if Matt could do um, a theory or two on StarCraft 2, okay? I mean, I love StarCraft 2 and I would love to see some of his theories about it. Although, secretly, I would prefer to watch. Um, one of Austin's video, the science of StarCraft 2, like <laughs> how the um, how the shields, how the Protoss shields uh, don't make any sense, or you know how the Zerg could not be able to evolve that quickly. I've actually got one that's actually that would actually be very good. If you remember in um, in Heart of a Swarm, okay. In the heart of a swarm, and during the mission in which I think it's yeah, it's a mission in which Karagad um, has to fight against uh, Narud. You start off uh, in a no build segment with, uh, where Karagad is going to uh, the Mobius facility, uh, Mo um, a Mobius court, uh, Mobius foundation facility, and they find a dead ultralisk. And Strukov um, says it's a shame that it's dead. It could have helped us, and then. Um, Abathur replies, uh, Organism Stukov, uh, uh, something along the lines of uh, Organism Stukov misunderstands death irrelevant, only essence important, or something like that. I don't remember exactly what the quote is. And then he wakes up the dead ultralisk. Like, I would be interested to watch a video on how that would work. Okay? I would be extremely interested on how he was able to bring that. Um, dead ultralis go back to life. Hmm. But anyway, yeah, that's my own thing. But uh, sorry, very little side tangent. I just wanted to get it out there. But yeah, on here are theories killing video games. I sadly think both yes and no. My point of view is basically the same as Matt's. Basically, where I think that theories are very good for video games, but not just for video games, like also for films and TV series. They are very important. They are what I think to be one of the heights of, um, uh, how do you say, like uh, interact um, interactivity for, uh, for fans, you know. Like, um, I'm someone who is rubbish at drawing, meaning that I cannot do art for it. My drawings are hideous. I am not a natural drawer. Meaning that I cannot draw a fan art. So I do that, I cannot do. I have dabbled in writing, but I am very bad at it. So I would not be able to be a fan fiction author. Meaning that the only thing that I've got left that I can do is two things. First of all, talk about what I like. Like I can talk about what I think about video games, which I might be doing at some point later on on this channel, uh, but the only thing, the only real thing that I can do is theorize on video games. That's like one of the only things that I can do to, you know, show that I love this series, basically. And all of this, of course, I'm saying is free because if I really wanted to show how much I love something, yeah, I would be able to buy it. But I am not someone with a lot of money. I'm sure you've seen like my Game Theory hoodie, but that's like one of the only merch items that I own. But yeah. So yeah, I can make theories, but there are also points on uh, when theories can also be destructive. Like he said, there are some theories that can be destructive, okay? And yeah, th there are some points where making theories can change the outcome of a game, which I find to be very, very bad, honestly. And no game developer or author or 
or a um, screenwriter should ever change what they think of a, a their view or their vision to uh, make us wrong. If we find out the plot, then that's fine. Just suck up to it. I mean, that's very good. Like he said, it shows that you were able to smartly learn the clues. You shouldn't punish yourself by changing your original vision. On the contrary, you should congratulate yourself, yourself because you did something that we could follow. But yeah, that's all I've got to say on this video. This is a bit of a short video because I'm a bit tired. I've come back from a from five days of holiday of, of um, on the side of the beach, and I'm tired. I came home today at like around five o'clock in the afternoon. So yeah. Now I'm going to go to sleep and then I'm going to start editing this video in the morning. I just thought I wanted to get this video done and ready, but I've got something to push out um, for the end of the week. That's it for today. Goodbye!